Hi everybody, welcome to Geek Chess. Coach Franco here with a video on the Chess World Champions. You can find our companion piece on our Mighty Networks. Uh, link in the description. Alright, so what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about each world champion in turn, how they got to be world champion and maybe something interesting about the player themselves. I apologize for some of the uh, photos. Uh, it's the best I could do um, under my you know, circumstances of not finding HD photos for everything. Okay, so let's start with a Mr. Wilhelm Steinitz. There's a photo of him playing against Johannes Zakertot, which was the first official World Championship match, which came about, interestingly enough, uh, there's a big gigantic chess banquet in London, all of the world's best chess players are there and the master of ceremonies asked will the best player in the world please stand up and Johannes and Wilhelm both stood up so they decided to prove who was best and they had the tournament the next year Wilhelm Steinitz won the match there's a nice photo of him with his beard okay so he kept the title for quite a long time and eventually, a young man with the name of Emmanuel Lasker challenged him to the title. Now, Emmanuel Lasker was much younger and, um, you know, chess theory and stuff kept moving on. So he knew some stuff that Steiners didn't. And he won the title, becoming the second world chess champion. Emmanuel kept the title for 27 years. The, uh, I think that's the longest run. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the longest run every anybody had was was 27 years. Uh, Kasparov had 15 years, which I think is second closest. Although Kasparov had uh, a very, very, very long undefeated streak, which is very scary. But we'll get to Kasparov when we get to Kasparov. So Emmanuel Lasker, the second world chess champion, he had the title for 27 years, and he lost his title in a match against Cuban Jose Rahul Capablanca. Now, there's a lot of things you can talk about Capablanca. He was famous for having a perfect end game, essentially. You could look in a, a position and he would calculate it perfectly like a computer. His end game technique was like a computer, it's always said. And he is rumored to have mastered the game, well not mastered the game of chess, knew the game of chess at age 3. W so well enough that he could correct his father if his father made an incorrect move. He apparently learned to play chess by watching his father and his father's friend. After his father discovered his chess talent, he went around Cuba and by the age 10 he's been beating everybody in Cuba and then he started playing internationally. There's another nice story about him where he was sitting in a chess cafe, a man came in, sat down to play him, Capablanca took the queen off of the board and the man asked him, why did you remove your queen? I could beat you. And Capablanca said, if you could beat me, I would know who you are. I, I like that story. I think that's pretty cool. Okay, so uh, Capablanca beat Lasker to become the third world chess champion. And... Um, Everybody who wants to get better at endgame should definitely, definitely, definitely study his games. This serious looking man is Alexander Alekai. You can find uh, his full name in our article. It's Alexander Alexandrovich Alekai. He was the first world champion to get the title back after a rematch. Like you can see here, there's two dates. Okay, First date is when he lost it. When he, when he had it and then he lost it and then he got it again, okay. So he was a very interesting character. There's, there, there's wild stories about him. His games are very, 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 very interesting. Um, he, he had some very strange positions that you would look at and the computer would look at and the computer would go and have a cup of coffee because it doesn't know what's going on. And then you leave it a little bit longer and then you find the best move. But the point is, he, he had a very unique style, he had very unique positions, and he calculated them very, very well. There's a thing in chess called a 
Alekine's gun, which is your two rooks and your queen on an open pile, and it gets its name from this this man, Alexander Alekhan. Now, Alexander Alekhan lost his title against a man called. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm pressing all the wrong buttons. A man called Max Ew. Now, what can I tell you about Max Ew? Max Ew was Dutch. He comes from Holland. He became FIDE president, which, which he used the platform to really, really promote chess. He, he genuinely was um, a huge part of getting chess popular, um, popular when he was the FIDE president. He played very, very interesting games. He played very good games, very solid games. But unfortunately, unless you're um, inclined to look at the history of chess, very few chess players um, have seen his games or looked at his games. You have to go and uh, study our history if you want to um, see about these guys. Because everybody knows Magnus this and Ding Liren this and whoever the latest Indian player this. But missing out on where all of these kids, all of these new people get their ideas from because everything that's being played today has been built upon the previous world champion has been built upon the previous best players in the world and we take their games and their knowledge and how they played and we use computers to help us to improve what they did so everything comes from someone before right that's that's just how it is and this is why i think it's very important that we acknowledge the world champions who came before and learn a little bit more about them and so please i i ask you very nicely even if it's just one game for black and one game for white go and see something about max ew because uh it's not a name that a lot of beginners or intermediate players recognize. Michal Bodvinik was the sixth world champion and he started the Bodvinik school for chess in Russia. So this was a very, very, very important school. Uh, Michal Tal came out of that, Gary Kasparov came out of that, um, Anatoly Karpov came out of that school and so many other great Russian and Soviet chess players came out of this school. Uh, Mikhail Bodvinik was a very, very serious man. He never played chess for fun, like at all, which is very weird <laughs> to me. But he would, it's, it's just he, would, he was so serious and dedicated that he only played chess seriously. And he was a very, very, very great player. And with Mikhail Bodvinik becoming the sixth world chess champion, Russia started dominating tournaments and started dominating the world champion scene because all of the best chess players came from Russia, the rest of the world knew this because of the system they had and the school for Bodvinik was, was part of the system. They would find young kids who are talented at chess and they would send them to the school and the government would pay them, uh, let's call it a salary, to just play chess. They, they took chess very seriously. Like we take rugby and cricket seriously, Russia took chess seriously. And we hope one day in the future, hopefully I'll be alive to see that that can happen for us. Now, Mikhail Bodvinik. He defended his title two times and he was just a very, very strong player. Also, interestingly about Bodvinik is he quit chess in 1970 to become uh, or, or not to become to go and work on um, chess playing um, computers it's thanks to his work or you know he was part of the group of people who gave us deep blue which beat kasparov and stockfish and eventually leela and alpha zero um, Mikhail Bodvinik was part of the generation of men and women who made that possible for us. It's thanks to his work and his contemporaries that we have the engines we have today. Very, very, very important man. Now, like I said, 
He lost his title and defended it a bunch. But we're not going to worry about his defense games. We're just going to worry about who took his title the first time. And that's a man named Vasily Smyslov. Vasily Smyslov on the left. Uh, if you can read the, the Russian way to spell Smyslov. Um, unfortunately, um, Smyslov it's had a bit of a boring life. Um, he was a operatic singer. Which now that I say that might not be boring. It's, ve it's actually very interesting <laughs> if you're into that. But yeah, he was a he was a, he was an opera singer, if I remember correctly, and he kept the title for exactly one year. Unfortunately, the thing is, if you beat Bodvinik, Bodvinik gets angry and then he studies all of your moves, all of your games, and then he just beats you. That's how Bodvinik rolled. <laughs> he was a very um, like I said, a very serious player. Again, Vasily Smyslov has the same problem that Max Eu has. So I would please ask you guys to go look at one or two of his games. So that you can appreciate who he was and what he did. Because at the end of the day, um, he was a world champion. And he deserved to have that title, even if it was only for one year. Getting to the top of the mountain is not easy and every single one of the world champions deserve to be there. Now, Vasily Smyslov was the seventh world chess champion and Bodvinik beat him in a rematch. And then Bodvinik kept the title and then the youngest world chess champion at the time came along, Mikhail Misha. Mr. Tal here is my favorite chess player ever because I like his name very, very much and I like this photo of him with his balls on the side. I don't know why I like that, but this photo um, always makes me smile when I see it. Now, he was known as the Magician of Riga and he played wild, wild attacking games and he made sacrifices that, you know, other people wouldn't make and the thing is, people, oh, Misha, he would sacrifice and he would do so well. But but the truth of the matter is, it's 50-50. Some of his games he won, some of his games he lost. And it's really just his style that made him stand out. But at the end of the day, his unique style confused Bodvinik in the first match they had. And he became the youngest world chess champion at the time. He was age 23. Now a lot of oh that's not that's not that you know that's old that's not young. The thing is chess changed a lot in the past ten years, with the advent of um, chess playing computers on everybody's phones and laptops. Uh, the youth of today, the they are getting chess training that just wasn't available when these guys were playing. So, you know, it's. The, the landscape is very much changed but regardless he was the youngest chess player at the time and or the world champion at the time and he beat Bodvinik in a very very exciting matches he also wrote a very very good book um, I think it was my 60 memorable games or something like that um, and it's a very well written book uh, with were very exciting games in it and he was a very good writer you should if you can um, find that book and read it it's it's, it's a very very good chess book it will definitely um, teach you more about the man and more about the game but regardless eight world chess champion Michatel uh, like Smyslov before him he only had the title for unfortunately um, one year now our next photo is of Tikhan Petroshin. I wish I, I made this bigger, but that would um, throw out all of my other photos. Uh, Mr. Tikhan Petroshin is known as Ayan Tikhan. He's from Armenia. Um, and he was known as a very defensive player. It was very difficult to attack him. He, w he wouldn't mind making draws, so he would just hunker down and defend your position until you made a mistake. And... He was also very good at making prophylactic moves. Now, prophylaxis in chess is when you make that move, let's say you're playing white, and you play h3 to stop the bishop or 
not getting into G4, that's a prophylaxis move, right? You make a move to stop the opponent doing something. And he was very, very good at that. I am Tikhan Petrosian. And he's also a name that falls to the wayside. So again, I urge you guys to go and look at these games. If you want to learn how to, to defend better, I would definitely, definitely recommend Tikhan Petrosian. Now, he was the ninth world chess champion and he lost his title to a man named anybody anybody Boris Spassky oh poor poor Boris Boris is known for the rest of time as the man who lost to Bobby Fischer which is very very unfortunate because Spassky was a good player he was an all-around player and he was very 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 good i personally think these games are, are are you know interesting but unfortunately um like i said before because of um the fact that he lost to bobby fisher he also kind of gets cast in the shadow because when you look at bobby fisher you go wow the best player ever and you know Spassky again falls to the wayside which is very um, very sad but yeah again guys just go and look at one or two of these games um, I would very much appreciate it um, regardless Boris Spassky unfortunately he lost the title to Bobby Fischer and I say unfortunately because um, Spassky seems to be forgotten when it comes to uh, to Bobby Fischer. So let's talk about Bobby Fischer. From Bodvinik up until Spassky, every single world champion came from the Soviet Union. All of them were Russian players. And at the time, the Cold War was on, which was a kind of a tense situation between Russia and America. So this world championship against uh, uh, against Sp um, Spassky was seen by the Americans as an analogy for the Cold War that's going on. If the American can beat the Russian, then in the real life, the war will go that way as well. It was a very strange situation. Let's quickly talk just a little bit about Bobby Fischer. Uh, Robert James Fischer was dominating since the age of 11. He played the game of the century when he was age 14, which had this wonderful uh, windmill against, um, I want to say Donald Byrne, maybe. I, I don't remember the guy's name off of the top of my head. I haven't looked at it in a long time. But yeah, Bobby was just dominating from a very, very young, young age. Um, I think he started playing chess at, at age 10 or, or 11 I'm not sure but it was quickly apparent he was very very good at chess as a teenager he would just go around beating a bunch of people and then yeah he was just untouchable um, for a very very long time and as he went up in the ranks uh, he started getting more confident and he had one aim in mind to become world chess champion that's all he thought about and eventually he did he, b he beat Spassky soundly now there's a bunch of stuff that happened in that world champion which is a video on its own there's a documentary on YouTube you can watch on Bobby Fischer but um, yeah he played so well that in one of the games Spassky stood up and clapped hands that's how good Bobby Fischer was and while that world championship was going on Bobby Fischer single-handedly caused America to have a chess boom. The biggest chess boom there's ever been. Now, the Queen's Gambit caused a chess boom as well, but nothing compared to what, what Fischer did. So, Bobby Fischer played chess, he played the World Championship, he won the World Championship, and then he decided not to play again. At all. There was some uh, disputes on um, the terms for the next world championship and Bobby wasn't happy about it so he refused to play 
the next match so because of that what happened is there was a uh, tournament and the winner of the tournament would become the 12th world champion and Anatoly Karpov a small unassuming man um, I want to remember where he came from because he came from a mountainous area um, yeah, I don't think I'm going to remember off the top of my head. But yes, he he won the right to become world champion. And he kept the title for 10 years. For 10 years, nobody could beat Anatoly Karpov. And he deserved to be as good as, you know, to be the best in the world. Because he put in a lot of work. He played extremely solidly. Um, if you guys ever want to learn what to do when you're not sure, you do, when you know you don't have a good move, go and look at his games. He would move a bishop just one square, just to improve it just a little bit, not changing the position. And then the other player would move something. And then he would move a pawn just one square up, not changing anything. And he was very, very, very good at, uh, good at that. Um, Magnus does that a lot too. But if you want to study it properly go and check out Karpov now Karpov was world number one for 10 years up until a certain point and this is a very nice photo of him up until he met this man oops sorry I'm pressing a, bun a bunch of wrong buttons there we go he met Gary Kasparov now when Gary Kasparov came on the scene him and Karpov started a rivalry which we haven't seen again in chess ever. It was epic. It was, I don't know, Spider-Man and Venom. It was uh, Thanos and the Avengers. It was huge. It was gigantic. It was, the, it was just, I, I can't even start to explain how huge this thing was, right? They were... I don't know like I don't know it was amazing so this was a question of who is the best player in the world but magnified right because um, both of these well Gary had a huge ego and he wanted to prove he's better than Anatoly Karpov and they started fighting and their world championship matches are legendary it, it it's close all the time. When attacks land, it's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. And they would trade back and forth and they would trash talk each other. And it was amazing. But eventually the dust settled and Gary Kasparov stood on top of the mountain as the 13 world chess champion. And he dominated chess up until 2005. From 1985 up until his, his retirement in 2005, he was the undisputed world number one. There was not a question. Everybody knew who Gary Kasparov was. My dad doesn't play chess and he knows the name Gary Kasparov, right? This is how famous this man is. And he did a lot for chess. Like, a lot. Gary Kasparov was just such an en enigmatic figure that lay people knew who he was. And one of the things he did was he played against Deep Blue. Here's a photo of him playing against Deep Blue. Deep Blue was a chess playing engine made by IBM. And up until that point, chess computers had no chance of beating human players at all. Like, there was no, no chance. But Deep Blue beat Gary. Gary was dumbstruck. He didn't know what to say. He was very, very, very upset. <laughs> he was so upset about it. But it's thanks to this match that um, chess computers also became a bigger thing. So, Bodvinik stopped playing chess in order to help with chess computers. And here we have Kasparov playing chess computers. Right? It's very interesting. Okay. So anyway, so then Gary Kasparov, you can see there it says split title into 2000s. Now, let me just check if the next photo, yeah, that's Kasparov and Karpov, very nice, when they were young. I think Gary was 21 when he got the title, so he became the world's youngest grandmaster at the time. 
um, Star Wars 23, Jazz Pro Office 21. Um, so it says split title because in 1992, I think it was, Gary Kasparov wasn't happy with FIDE and he split away to make the Professional Chess Association, the PCA. So they held their own world championship. And chess was very confusing for a long while, up until 2006 when we had the re re uh, unification match. So there was two separate world championship lines at this time, okay? This video is just the um, official world champions, okay? We'll learn about the other guys in due time. Okay, so regardless, Gary Kasparov lost his title to Vladimir Kramnik in 2000. So in the year 2000, Vladimir Kramnik became the undisputed, um, uh, became the classic world champion when he beat Gary Kasparov in the year 2000. That's why Kasparov said 2000. And then uh, in 2004, Peter Liko challenged Kramnik and Kramnik won again. And then in 2006, Vesel and Topolov, and please guys, if you've never heard about Vesel and Topolov, please go check out his games. His games are so exciting. I like Vesel and Topolov's games. I don't even, I can't even tell you how excited I am. Please, if you haven't checked Vesel and Topolov playing chess, please watch him play chess. He's, he's very, um, I think he's exciting, or he used to be exciting when he was younger, but regardless, he's got very good games, very, very good games under his belt. So the reunification match in 2006 was all about getting one world champion again. Like I said before, up until this point, it was split between FIDE and PCA. So it's Toplo versus Kramnik. I think Toilet Gate happened around this time as well. If you guys don't know what Toilet Gate is, I'm sure chess.com has articles on it. It was, it was very silly. Um, but yeah, Kramnik won. Oh, what I almost forgot to say about Vladimir Kramnik, uh, besides being a very, very, very good player, uh, Vladimir Kramnik is single-handedly responsible for popularizing the Berlin again. It's it's due to his game with Gary Kasparov that we that we've had the Berlin since 2000 again, because the Berlin fell off in popularity, and then uh, Kramnik and his games made uh, it come back. Just like with um, Caruana and Magnus where after Magnus played the Rosimilo uh, a bunch of times, or well, however you pronounce that in the Sicilian, now, you know, that happened a bunch after that game. Anyway, so Vladimir Kramnik beat Gary Kasparov in 2000, he beat uh, Peter Liko in 2004, and then he beat Vesel and Topolov in 2006 to officially become the world's undisputed world chess champion and gaining the title as the 14th world champion. And he deserved it, there's, there's no question. He had a very long road and there was a bunch of stuff going on in chess and he deserved to have the title. He was a very, very solid player, very introspective about his opponents and studying what his opponents are going to do and playing against them. Um, he, yeah, he was very stu uh, studious. He, he made sure to prep. Everybody preps, but Kramnik prepped very well. Here we have and we're almost done. We've got two more guys to go. Vishwana Fan Anand. Vishi Anand. India's greatest sportsman. And uh, there's a reason why I say this. That's a very nice photo of him shaking hands with Kramnik, who he beat in 2007 to become the 15th world chess champion. Now, if we could talk a little bit about Mr. Anand. Vishwana Fan Anand. I was from India, which these days all of the best chess players come from. It used to be everybody comes from Russia, but now everybody comes from India. And it's due, let's see if I have another photo of him. Yeah, there's a nice photo of him in Magnus. It's due to Vishwana Fandanan. And the reason for this is chess is a cultural sport, a uh, cultural sport in India, right? Che we all can agree chess came from India. And because of what Anand was doing on the world stage for chess, India recognized what he did. He was the first person to receive India's uh, medal for astounding achievement in a sport. And 
the Indian cricket team gave him that medal. That is how important Vishwanathan Anand is in India for chess. And it's due to him that generations of young Indian players looked up to him and said, if he can do it, I can do it as well. And now we have all of these brilliant players coming out of India and dominating the scene. And they keep getting younger and younger and younger. And Anand has all of these workshops and he's got all of these um, foundations and stuff, um, as far as I'm aware, uh, helping these chess players become what they are. And it's, it's very, very um, great to see that happening in India because we would, we would love to have that happen here. We would love to have it happen everywhere in the world. And it's thanks to, I- to Anand having this um, position in India that chess could have this boom there. And we hope that one day we can have that for South Africa as well. So, Vishwanathan, of course, lost his title too. As we all know, Mr. Magnus Carlsen. Mr. Magnus Carlsen. The probably the greatest chess player of all time. I mean, may Gary usually beats him in falls, but what can you say about Magnus Carlsen? Magnus Carlsen took the title in 2013 and he has kept it. He has been the number one highest rated player on the planet for like for more than a decade. Um, his games are insane he out calculates everybody he his opening theory is everywhere i mean name an opening and he knows lines that haven't been played in like decades and he can look at a game and know whose game it was when it was played of course he has to study it but his memory for the game for what he studied is also of such a caliber that he's he's, he's, he's untouchable He's definitely untouchable. Now, interestingly enough, in, I want to say, 2003, 2004, maybe 2005, 2006, um, when they asked about, uh, they asked Gary Kasparov about young players to look out for, and Gary said, Magnus Carlsen is the only one that stands out. And... At the and then a couple of like a decade later, we have the the world champion we have now, and Magnus is amazing. Uh, I'll make a video on Magnus uh, uh, at some point, but yeah, Magnus is somebody we should all emulate. We should emulate his work ethic. We should emulate um, how much work, yeah, like I said, how much work he puts into it. We, we must emulate his joy of chess, his his firstiness to win. Um, because something he does, which is very important, is even if it's a drawn position, he doesn't stop playing. He keeps going, ho- waiting for his opponent to make a mistake. And this is something we, we can learn from that doesn't matter how hopeless the position is, we, we can still try for a win. And unfortunately for, for Chess, um, he said he's going... To He's stepping down. He's not going to uh, participate in the next World Championship. But I think that's good because, like he said, he wants to keep chess fun. He wants to keep playing the way he wants to play. And he's still going to be the undisputed number one. Whoever is going to become the 17th World Chess Championship next year, uh, champion next year, is going to be in the shadow of Magnus Carlsen for a very long time. Just like everybody was still in the shadow of Kasparov after Kasparov lost the title. Because Kasparov didn't just go away after he lost the title. And Magnus is going to be the same way. And we still have a lot of years of Magnus playing chess, hopefully. So it's going to be very interesting to see who's going to get the title next. Um, I can't even begin to guess. But it's going to be very interesting. Okay, guys, this was a very long video on a bunch of, uh, on all of the world chess champions up until Magnus. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Remember to go check out our um, 
our article in the description as well. Have a great day, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.